Oops, sorry, I'm moving around. I'm trying to function your eyes. There we go. And the CME transcripts info. And then the AAFP credit system information. And then the information about court competencies. All right, and our conflict of interest statement. So Armando Flores and Tapas Newell and their faculty preceptor, Mark Nato, have no financial relationships with an eligible company to disclose. All right, Dr. Nato, your introduction. <laughs> So thanks for the opportunity. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, two of our outstanding residents who are going to give this uh, grand rounds. They wouldn't even tell me which order they're going to present in. So I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order, right? So in no particular order, um, adding puffs of steroid inhaler to rescue inhaler in moderate to severe asthma. That will be presented by Dr. Armando Flores and um, albuterol, uh, Budesonide fixed dose combination rescue inhaler for asthma, and that's to be presented by Tapas Newell. All right, so it appears that uh, Dr. Flores would be presenting first. All right, so I'm uh, Manuel Flores, one of the recently PGY2 to PGY3 status residents here in the San Antonio uh, Utah Residency Family Medicine Residency Program. Um, the mention went over. So, uh, so objectives on the so to mention the title of the presentation, I'll just repeat it: adding puffs of steroid inhaler to rescue inhaler uh, in moderate to severe asthma. Uh, some of the ob objectives we'll be going over today are recognizing lack of data uh, of asthma treatment in minority populations, uh, distinguishing when to use SMART or which means single maintenance and reliever therapy uh, versus alternative methods. Um, We'll outline the findings for study of interest uh, that this presentation was based on, and mostly just prepare to use alternative methods for asthma control in uh, patients you see. So this is based on a AFP poem that posed a question in African American and Hispanic adults with moderate to severe asthma, does adding uh, an extra puff of a steroid inhaler whenever they use their short acting inhaler uh, in as needed situations reduces exacerbations compared with usual care. So why is this uh, an important question to ask? Uh, unfortunately, African-American and Hispanic patients usually have higher rates of BD visits and uh, hospitalizations uh, compared to the Caucasian population. Uh, asthma exacerbations uh, these also cause a twice as high mortality rate. Um, and many of the studies that led to asthma recommendations and guidelines, uh, did not have a uh, significant population, uh, significant Hispanic or uh, African-American population in the study. So uh, unfortunately, health disparities remain. So as we know, uh, recently in 2020, 2020 uh, Gina updated their guideline, uh, recommending mainly for 12 years and older, all adults, smart therapy using the single uh, combined ICS and lab for maintenance therapy and as needed reliever. Uh, there's about 10 studies they based this on. Uh, they had a limited inclusion of African-American Hispanic populations. Um, and there's concerns, uh, even someone in the, one of the family medicine physicians in the AFP published uh, uh, opinion on conflicts of interest concerns uh, in many of the studies and in the GINA panel uh, with the company that makes that inhaler uh, that we know as uh, Simba Court. Uh, so the National Asthma Committee, or NAEPP, had a little different recommendations. They don't recommend SMART until step three of the five steps of uh, asthma escalation therapy, uh, whereas, you know, in GINA, it's starting at step one. Uh, there's also insurance coverage issues. Not every insurance is going to cover Simba Court. Um, and there's also still an FDA caution for using this inhaler as, on an as-needed basis. So the previous research um, has been limited in terms of including significant portions of African-American and Hispanic patients in their studies. One example, um, mostly in uh, African-American children, found that they did not respond as African-American adults did to adding a long-acting beta agonist and step-up treatment. Uh, they responded similarly to adding a uh, daily steroid. So this kind of 
goes into conflict that maybe all the studies are not generalizable across all patients. Uh, but as we mentioned, the updated GINA guidelines only for 12 years and older. Uh, also, so one of the problems also seems to be um, education. Um, there was one study in particular that found ways to improve out, uh, education, but inconclusive results. There was further research still to be recommended and that's um, still in the process. Um, another study actually along the US-Mexico border in the Valley found that a lot of the patient, Hispanic patients had didn't have sufficient knowledge of what asthma was and how to use inhalers. So that's another barrier that seems to be in the way of uh, maintaining control of asthma. So as I mentioned, uh, the poem in the AAFP was based on an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Reliever Triggered Inhaled uh, Glucocorticoid in Black and Latinx Adults with Asthma. And this study was a patient-powered study that aimed to evaluate improvement of asthma outcomes, mainly uh, asthma exacerbations um, in this population, given there's not much uh, research that have mainly focused on this population. It was randomized, however, it was open label trial, mainly because they wanted it to be patient powered uh, so they knew what inhaler they were using. Uh, the study included people from ages 18 to 75, um, mostly women, about 85%. And some of the inclusion criteria of note um, had to be that they were on a prescribed daily steroid inhaler uh, with or without long acting beta agonist. Um, they either had to have uncontrolled asthma based on a ACT score or asthma control score, or at least uh, one patient reported asthma exacerbation in the past year, or need for steroids or overnight hospitalization. Um, about 72% of the patients in the study had at least one exacerbation in the past year. Um, of note, former or current smokers were also included, um, but they did not include patients that were taking uh, regular steroids for severe asthma. So some of the methods, um, all patients continued usual care, which was a daily steroid inhaler or with or without uh, uh, long acting beta agonist uh, supplemented by the as needed uh, short acting beta agonist reliever. Um, those randomized to the intervention group were also uh, told to use an additional uh, steroid puff. In this case, they used beclomethasone, um, 80 micrograms for every puff of the reliever or if they were using a nebulizer for uh, fascinated relief, they were advised to use five pumps. Um, and they did have a one-time educational um, session before they started the study on how to use inhaler, make sure they knew um, how to use them properly. And then they were followed monthly uh, with surveys for 15 months. Um, groups were balanced and uh, their analysis was by intention to treat. So what did they find? Um, over the 15 months, they did find a slightly lower uh, annual rate of exacerbation in the intervention group with a hazard ratio of 0.85. Um, confidence interval was narrow, but it nearly crossed one. As you can see on the slide, it's, it was the top 0 0.999. Um, and they also found approximately one fewer exacerbation for every eight patients who received usual care plus the uh, intervention uh, compared with just usual care alone. They found asthma control scores increased as well. Um, there were uh, adverse events, but not difference between the two groups. And uh, another reason of note, looking at similar research, there's also a recent study that uh, looking at a new uh, formulation inhaler using albuterol and budesonide in moderate to severe asthma found similar uh, results. Um, there was no info on demographics in this study, but it was done across several areas, North America, South America, Europe, and South Africa. And that's regarding that other similar study. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that formulation, new formulation inhaler is really prominent in the market yet. Or actually, I'm not sure if it's been approved. Um, so going over uh, the study of interest for, the present, for this presentation, um, there were a few limitations. It was open label, but that's mostly because they wanted it to be patient activated in terms of when they use their inhaler. Um, a large portion of partic participants were women, but women constitute two thirds of many of the, much of the burden of asthma and uh, exacerbations compared to men. 
So this might not be uh, exactly generalizable to uh, male patients. Um, and as I noted, it did include uh, current and former smokers, which might raise a possible um, consideration of some other type of like emphysema, COPD. There's no information on if that was also involved in this. Um, of note, in the population that they studied, many of them did have obesity as well, um, but there was not much comment on whether that was significant confounder. So look at the findings overall. Um, so smart therapy that the GINA guideline recommends may not always be uh, applicable, especially if the said inhaler is not covered by a patient's insurance or they can't afford it if they're paying out of pocket. Um, so this may provide an alternative option um, especially in the, many of the patients we see here um, are either Hispanic or African-American. Um, so this might give us another option to use if we can't use uh, the, uh, the semicord. Uh, so in the case that they were to use their short-acting beta agonist, we can advise them to use one puff of the steroid inhaler um, for every puff of that uh, short-acting uh, reliever. And so, yeah, it would have been optimal if they excluded patients who smoke or maybe further stratified information on whether patients had COPD, emphysema, things like that. Um, and the p-value, while significant, was pretty close to 0 0.05, uh, which is a common uh, marker uh, for rejecting uh, null hypothesis. Um, and confidence interval, uh, while narrow, was pretty close to crossing one. Uh, would have liked that to be more uh, convincing as well. So considering issues using SMART, as I mentioned, this might be an alternative, um, but there's still, I think, further research needs to be done, um, mainly focusing on Hispanic and African-American populations. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, as family medicine physicians, we need to be always open to the available different alternative options as you know what a guideline might recommend is not always uh, feasible in patients we see. Um, and importantly, we should always use our resources. For example, a pharmacy can be of great assistance. Um, always ensuring our patients are well-educated on, as on asthma and what it means and how to use their inhalers or making sure they have a spacer as well or they're using it properly. Um, and if not, if time limit is limited, always uh, engage pharmac pharmacists that can help provide uh, show patients how to use inhalers. Um, for example, in our university pharmacy, we have I think pretty good coverage using the brand inhalers, but that might not be the case um, everywhere. Uh, or if patient is paying out of pocket, sometimes that uh, may also pose another barrier as well. But um, overall, uh, I think more research is still needed in minority populations. Um, smart therapy may not always be an option. Uh, so we need to be just remain open to alternative options to maximize control of uh, uh, patients' asthma that we see. Um, so uh, all in all, based on the AFP poem, the recommendation would be if you can't use smart therapy for some reason, um, we can see, try, at least try in our patients seeing, uh, adding a puff of a steroid inhaler to a short-acting beta agonist. Um, now it's using beclomethasone, unknown if, you know, we need further information to see if that's the case with every steroid inhaler. Um, they may not always uh, act the same in patients. Um, but yeah, overall, I think further information is needed or further research is still needed. Uh, but at least we have another option now uh, that's recommended. And there's some statistic statistically significant evidence uh, backing it up. But here you can see my references. And that's it for my section of the presentation. Any questions? Uh, about anything along with yes. Uh, I believe I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was pretty similar. Um, yeah, it was close. I have but I can't remember exact numbers. Uh, Right, and this it kind of does support uh, the GINA guideline. But Did you maybe... have any questions for the recording? Oh, I'm sorry. This question? Repeat the, repeat the question, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, sorry, one question. My second question was, uh, was that a benefit of like, the 
using this drug in order to prevent one in eight patients, one fewer investigation and they use patients. Is that a symbol of efficacy observing the two and five in the company? Uh, so the question is, uh, Compared to GINA guideline, um, do they have similar findings in terms of what this study found in terms of one fewer exacerbation for every eight patients? Um, they didn't note that is this kind of does support what many of the studies that led to the GINA updated GINA guidelines showed. Uh, they were just more so interested in seeing what other options and in minority population, what do they have the same findings? I guess we could say. So it kind of has similar findings. You could say to the many of the studies that led to the updated GINA guidelines. You twice mentioned education as something that had an effect on the patients. Uh, so was this education about the disease, about inhaler use, or or did it distinguish? In the in the study? In, in, well, you're talking you twice talk about oh. how education affected the outcome in the group. Right. Uh, there was are you referring to the study? I mentioned uh, along the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, so that in that study, so the question was, uh, what type of education were they referring to um, in terms of lack of uh, asthma-related knowledge? I believe it was was both what I guess what asthma really was, and it could not really explain it, um, and also improper use of inhalers. So I think it was a little of both in the study that they found um, both lack of asthma-related knowledge in terms of what. Uh, how to control asthma and use of using that, making sure that they use inhaler daily, um, and then proper use of inhaler as well. And if I just might add a comment, so you mentioned that uh, uh, pharmacists can help instruct them, and the nurses can help sometimes instruct them about inhaler use. Um, but I'd encourage you, you know, we should all know how to do that too. So. Right. Because sometimes you just get, get asked a question about it as part of the visit. So you sort of know the steps and what you're supposed to do for yourself. Right. You know, we should definitely also know ourselves uh, how to teach patients how to use inhalers. Um, it doesn't take that long, a couple minutes. There's even videos. Um, I don't know the website off the top of my head, but that does a pretty good job of showing patients how to use an inhaler uh, that you can always give them just in case they want to review making sure that they're doing it correctly. Any uh, further comments or questions? Thank you. All right, guys, good afternoon. My name is Tapas. I'm one of the residents as well, just like Armando. Um, I'm doing the second part of this presentation, which is also on asthma. Uh, I think Dr. Flores here kind of touched on one of my studies. Uh, he had it hidden somewhere, so I'm actually going to talk about it a little more. And it says preceptor's first and last name. That's Dr. Mark Nadu. I don't know why it's still blank over there. Uh, he's been my preceptor, um, guiding me along this presentation made over here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it shouldn't have been blank. So just quickly summarizing the points, what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to go a little more about asthma in general first. I'm gonna talk about some risk factors, what, what the danger signs are, and I'm not doing that just to review asthma. It's because I always try to find a reason why I don't like a study. But in fact, this study I actually really liked. And the reason for that is because the criteria that they used actually goes back to the very basics of asthma. You know, They're looking at the risk factors in the population, the danger signs, and how they assessed even looking at or selecting the population. So it's, it's a pretty decent study, but I probably shouldn't have said that because that's my conclusion. Um, you know, I'm going to describe the, describe the standard treatment that we have right now, the current management for asthma, and see and compare what they're suggesting if that is something feasible for us. Um, of course, one of the most important things is I'm going to discuss in detail what the modified treatment or the medication that they're talking about, if that's even worth it or if it's feasible. Uh, and then I'll kind of throw out this question, you know, since we're practicing in San Antonio, I have a link to show from the local um local government here just to kind of show how asthma is in the San Antonio population. So we can kind of talk about that too. So the very basics, um, try not to read it, I'll talk about it. Um, so what are some of the risk factors for fatal asthma attack? Um, if there are indicators for severe disease, right? If you have had previous asthma exacerbations that are life-threatening. Uh, if you are having asthma attacks despite using the glucocorticoids, 
Um, if you're having more than one hospitalization in the year, some three or more emergency department visits, you're using a lot of medications per month. That's very important because they actually took that poor asthma control into their study and they used that patient population. And that's why I keep saying that, hey, I actually really like this study. Uh, if you have other comorbidities, right, cardiovascular, pulmonary issues, uh, illicit drug use, psychosocial issues, food allergy, um, compliance, right? If you're not using the medications appropriately, um, if you don't know what asthma symptoms are, the patients are not going to come look at you or as a physician or a pharmacist. If you don't know what to look for, that can also lead to, that's that's a risk factor uh, leading to a fatal asthma attack. So I kind of wanted to touch base on this before I um, went um, any further. Some of the clinical danger signs that we should be looking at if a patient is, or if patients are using accessory muscles, um, you know, if they're having some brief um, speech concerns, they cannot lay flat. That's a problem as well. Um, they're sweating a lot. There's a lot of diaphoresis. There's agitation. Uh, and if there's failure of improvement despite initial treatment, right? And I understand this overlaps with a lot of other diseases and issues you can see, right? That's why it's just a general thing, what you should be looking for um, and what are clinical danger signs of severe asthma exacerbation. Um, understand that these signs don't always have to be present. Um, if you have signs of any kind of imminent respiratory arrest, if you can't maintain the respiratory anymore, right? If you're, you're so fatigued that you can't even breathe anymore, that's another danger sign. Um, depressed mental status, you're altered, altered, your mental status changes, that could also be um, um, a clinical danger sign there. Some of the things I kind of wanted to review, how would you assess something? You could look at peak ex, uh, the peak expiratory flow. If it's less than 40% of the predicted, that actually signifies that, hey, there's a major obstruction going on because remember, abs, uh, asthma is an obstructive disease, not a restrictive disease. Uh, if you have severe hypoxemia, that they actually consider it less than 95% with high flow oxygen. That is still a severe hy hypoxemia and failure. Um, patients should be managed without waiting for ABGs, arterial blood gases. Uh, because, you know, that's going to show you the hypercapnia and you don't end up getting hypercapnia until you get into the fact that your PEF, your expiratory flow, uh, peak flows are less than 25%. And that's not a time that you want to wait for the patients. Chest radiograph is great. We get it all the time. Um, get it if you suspect pneumonia, pneumothorax, or if you're not 100% sure what the diagnosis is. But that should not preclude your uh, treatment if you're really suspecting an asthma exacerbation in a patient. So the reason, again, I'm, I'm talking about all these things is this kind of ties in with the article. And this actually made me understand the article a little better because I myself had to go back and review. You know, we see asthma a lot. We talk about it a lot. But just to kind of pick those nitty picky details there. So that kind of helped help me understand the article overall a little better. This is very important. Standard treatments of severe asthma exacerbations. So you start with, um, you know, inhaled beta agonist. I'm not going to read all of that. Beta agonist. Um, it's a uh, bronchodilator, right? That's what you're using. Obviously, you're going to use oxygen. You have to establish uh, intravenous access. Systemic glucocorticoids, very important for the purposes of my talk because right now, the standard treatments that we use are, hey, you use beta agonist, keep going down. Now you're using systemic uh, glucocorticoids. You're not using it in combination, not yet what I'm about to show you in the next slide. And then obviously magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate also works as a bronchodilator. The reason I wrote all those things, different types of management, because I went through five different types of management. And this is not a standard strict treatment. It is the generalized guideline I wanted to put, what's out there. So whether you're looking at home management of asthma exacerbation in adults and adolescents or office management in the same population, or even management of asthma exacerbations in the ER, or if you're looking at pediatric population in the, ha in the home, or you're looking at pediatric population in the ED. Majority of the current guidelines actually say albuterol first or inhaled uh, beta agonist first, then go down the line and then now use systemic glucocorticoids. So the reason I wanted to kind of show this is because the article or the study that I went through, the name of that is albuterol budesonide, fixed dose combination, rescue inhaler for asthma. So now they're kind of putting it all together and trying to see, hey, does that actually work or doesn't work? So this is a multinational study. Uh, I think Dr. Flores had kind of mentioned on it, uh, North America, South America, different regions. What that does, you'll see later, is that increases the external validity of a study. Uh, so I really, overall, really, really like this article. You know, they did the phase three. So what is a phase three? I kind of wanted to take a quick second to review it. 
when you're in phase one, you're looking at safety and toxicity of a study, right? Phase two, you're looking at dosing and efficacy of a study. Phase three is a much larger population where you're trying to compare a new treatment with the previous treatment. Um, and that's what the study is primarily doing. And phase four is obviously much larger scale. You're looking at post-marketing surveillance. Double blind, great. Nobody knows there's hopefully minimization of um, uh, bias. Also randomized, great. Event-driven trial, um, I had to read up a little bit on this. Basically, an event-driven trial is where you know what the endpoint is or when you want to stop the study. So in this case, their event-driven trial is like, hey, once we have 570 first event of severe asthma exacerbation, we're going to stop. What that does in a gist, it, it basically increases the efficiency of a study. You grab the data that you're looking for, you get that data, you analyze that data. So that's one way of looking at um, the study. So all these are very, very good points on this study um, that they did. The rationale for the study, so um, short-acting beta agonists, this is great. This is theoretically, it just blew my mind because I had never thought about it initially. It does not address worsening inflammation, right? If a patient is having severe asthma exacerbation to begin with, aren't we concerned about some sort of underlying inflammation? And if you're not taking care of that, does that leave the patient at risk for severe asthma exacerbations in the near future? I, I don't know. Albuterol is the most used rescue medication worldwide, and even the FDA has approved SABAs as the only rescue medication approved in the U.S. Um, a big rationale for the study is because they're looking at poor asthma control in the patients. They're looking at all these severe asthma exacerbations and morbidity and mortality, and they keep going back to the fact that, oh, these patients had airflow obstruction. These patients have recurring symptoms. There's still some underlying inflammation uh, fluctuating, but still some fluctuating and uh, you know persistent airway infl uh, inflammation going on. So the thought process was great. Why not look at inflammation and why not look at it from a study where you can combine the pedesonide and albuterol together? The study aims to evaluate the efficacy and safety of albuterol and budesonide. So, you know, and compare with the current standard guidelines of albuterol. So the fact that they're comparing it with the standard albuterol, that makes it phase three. But understand that they haven't lost efficacy and safety. So it's really important to understand if you're in a study, when you're going from phase one to phase two to phase three, you're getting more knowledge, you're getting more data, but you don't just forget the toxicity and the safety, right? So it, it's very clearly stated and it's kind of like a subliminal messaging. It's still evaluating the efficacy and safety, but that's not the primary study aim. The primary study aim is to compare the albuterol and videsonide with the original albuterol, um, with just the um, albuterol as rescue inhib. Um, and they used the patients who were using inhaled glucocorticoid containing maintenance therapies. That was very uh, standard. That was not a variable. That was a very constant throughout their study. So the study methods that they used, they made three different groups. Um, comparison group, just getting standard albuterol. Then one group getting albuterol with budesonide at a lower dose. And then getting another albuterol combination with budesonide with a higher, uh, higher dose. The primary efficacy endpoint was, like I said, the first severe asthma exacerbation, and they wanted to collect at least 570 patients with that. Um, obviously, they also look at secondary endpoints, which are how many times did you use the, um, how many times did you have the severe asthma exacerbations, right? How much glucocorticoids did you use for asthma? So these are all good things to look at. You want to minimize those. Um, these ACQ, AQLQ, and PKLQ, these are basically just asthma questionnaires. So these are quality of life, QLQ, quality of life questionnaires, pediatric asthma quality of life questionnaires, um, as well as asthma control questionnaires. And I'm going to talk about it just a tad bit more uh, in a little bit. So they looked at a lot of these because these can kind of hint or give you a probability of what's the likelihood or where does a patient stand um, currently in their um, asthma journey. It's more of a quantitative way to look at it. Like every other study, this study also looked at safety endpoints, adverse effects. Uh, I like the fact, I don't know if I've ever noticed this, but I do like the fact that they're looking at it at least until two weeks afterwards the study was done. So it kind of, you know, any residual effect is what they're looking at. Uh, one important thing in this study was the rescue use was limited to use of the trial method. So you're not creating all those variability in your trial. Uh, additional nebulizers were prohibited and changes in maintenance therapy was discouraged, right? You can't tell somebody like, hey, I'm sorry, you're going to die, but you have to stick to this trial. They have, patients have all the rights to leave the, at any point, you know, you have, it's, it, this is an ethical trial. So obviously they have the uh, option to change the maintenance therapy if they had to. Um, compliance was well monitored. 
Um, the last statement, I like it from an ethical standpoint, but I also think that's a weakness of a study. So I kind of wanted to just say it out right now instead of forgetting it later. So patients would just be, be discontinued if they had three or more severe asthma exacerbations within three months or five or more total. So from an ethical standpoint, I guess legal standpoint, it's also great. Let the patients be treated appropriately. But if you're excluding the bad data from your study, does that build bias towards the good data that you collected? I, I don't know, right? That can definitely invoke some sort of bias. So that could be one of the unavoidable flaws in the study the way I'm looking at it, because obviously, again, safety, patient safety, um, being ethical, being legal, it's obviously important. Um, so study methods, and this is why I kind of talked about the risk factors initially, because they did choose patients who've had at least one severe asthma exacerbations in the past 12 months. What are those, what are, what are, what are the criteria for at least one severe asthma exacerbation. Look at it. Three or more consecutive days of systemic glucocorticoids, ER or urgent care visit in a specific timeline, inpatient hospital stay in a specific timeline, your FEV1 values, your ASQ of 1.5 or more. And again, I'm gonna actually touch base on those scores. So just understand ACQ is basically a quantitative way of kind of figuring out patients' answers and figuring out where they are in their asthma journey. So it's so good because when they look at study methods, they actually used what severe um, asthma exacerbation risk factors would be. So to me, it's it's um, a very valid and fair comparison. Um, patient continued to receive inhaled glucocorticoid long acting beta 2 agonist combination. Um, exclusion criteria is great, COPD, right? If your baseline is not the perfect, kind of like what we look in the EKG. If a patient has a pacemaker, right? Their baseline is totally different. How do you look at in that EKG? You look at it a little differently. Same exact thing here. Uh, if the patient have received systemic glucocorticoids or any biologic treatment, uh, five half lives that's like a, you know, trying to figure out that it flushes out of your system. So there's, you're not looking at interactions between different things. So um, making your sample pretty standard and pretty good to look at from the get-go. Do not even try to look at this. This is for me. Uh, if you can look at it, and um, Dr. Nadu had a great feedback. I'm just going to say, put slides that people can read. <laughs> not the slides that people have to stare at and go like, um, so I'm going to change it for the next presentation. Thanks, Dr. Nader. Uh, but the only reason this slide is there is because it's kind of showing it's, you know, the population, the enrollment was well distributed amongst the different uh, tests you're looking at, different, different arms of the test you're looking at, about a thousand patients uh, in every single arm. Albuterol only, standard guideline, albuterol and bidacinide, low dose, and albuterol and bidacinide high dose. Do not read this again, same caveat. The reason I put this slide is because if you look at the demographics and characteristics, if you look at the three treatment arms, whether you look at age, uh, sex of the patient, race or ethnic group, uh, geographic region, you know, FEV1, no matter what you look at it, it's extremely well distributed. So uh, something that you always have to look at the data, right? Are you kind of throwing some bias in one area or not. And that's where, where randomization comes into play. So pretty well randomized here. Okay, so this is a tough slide, but I think we have some time, so that's good. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. I had to go back and brush up on a little bit of statistics myself. So they looked at two different things. The first dot uh, bullet point is pre-planned efficacy analysis. And the second one is intention to treat analysis. The difference between these two is your intention to treat analysis, you look at the data, even if the patients are not, you know, it's not just during the treatment time period, any kind of, you know, regardless of a change in the maintenance therapy or treatment discontinuation, you kind of carry that into your analysis. More realistic, more real life. Pre-planned efficacy analysis, more statistical, less real life. Um, basically, you look at the on-treatment period before treatment discontinuation. So it kind of reduces the type one error and type one error is your alpha error, right? where basically it means, so having a type one error or alpha error just means like, hey, in reality, there's no difference, but your test is showing that there is some difference. And that's what they're trying to control with the pre-planned efficacy analysis on it. And if you're controlling the type one or alpha error, that's also called um, false discovery rate, right? You decrease the false discovery rate. Now that spells out FDR. I know what Dr. Nato's thinking. Does anybody know at what time the FDR was the president? You know what he's going to say? That's my kind of resident. 
Anybody? No, I'll, I'll let you tell. Uh, I'll let you tell me, Doctor Nehru. Well, he was inaugurated on uh, March fourth. Wow. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. I just wrote the month because I didn't care about the day. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that decreases your uh, um, false discovery rate, basically. So this, again, I keep going back to it. Looking at the statistics of a study is so important because, you know, you can look at the data in very different ways. And I'm going to very quickly touch on these because this could be a lecture of its own. I'm not going to go there. And I'll try to see... 10 moments, 15 moments. So I'll try to kind of prove that why I really like that. So the third part is, you know, you have to have a predetermined power. Understand if you're trying to find a difference, a small, smaller and smaller difference, your power has to go up to be able to detect that smaller difference. And the significance level here was 5%. Time to event analysis is the primary endpoint in, in here. Time to event analysis, I've kind of already touched on it. It basically increases your efficiency. You know when to get the data, get out of the, uh, get out of the study. Hazard ratios, obviously they're gonna look at this, right? Because they're trying to compare the severe asthma exacerbation of the new drug versus the old established drug. Uh, they're looking at the annualized rate because you obviously wanna be more on the lower side. Um, they're looking at total systemic glucocorticoid exposure. You wanna be on the lower side. They use the Coxon Ransom test. That is primarily used for data that is uh, not gonna end up being um, normal distribution. And by all means, this data is not expected to be normal distribution. The last one is very important, response variables on ACQ, the um, asthma questionnaires for pediatrics, as well as the adult and the quality of life questionnaire. They use logistical regression model. Uh, best idea about using a logistical regression model is um, they're basically able to see how does an output change based on different input variables, right? So if you look at this study, they've actually used probably an appropriate statistical tool to make a point or to at least look at the data appropriately. Um, so findings and results, right? So, and this is the reason why I wanted to talk about asthma a little bit too, because the findings and results are very straightforward, very simplistic how they're showing. So in the intention to treat analysis, which the data is very similar to the pre-planned efficacy analysis, remember more real life where the people actually, you know, get out of the treatment and whatnot. They actually saw about a 26% reduction uh, in the time to event analysis, that means the first severe asthma exacerbation that happened reduced by 26%. Very, very similar to the pre-planned efficacy analysis. Uh, there's these graphs. I will not go over it. You can probably just look at it, your computer different. They're all color-coded. And that's what you're saying. As the time is going, they're looking at the cumulative probability. And that's why you're seeing the graph kind of trending up. Because the cumulative probability in comparison as time goes by um, it's going to keep going up, right? Because you're accumulating that probability overall. Um, findings and results, secondary outcomes. Uh, another feedback, when you put a link on PowerPoint, make sure you can read the link. So I'm going to change it next time. Thank you, Dr. Nehru. <laughs> um, wanted to talk about some of the secondary outcomes. Please do not look at these slides. The reason I wanted to put this, and you can probably see that in your computer, they're looking at all the secondary outcomes. So, you know, severe exacerbations. Here's your intention to treat analysis. You're looking at the rate ratio 0.75 with the comparison of the higher dose, 0.81 with the comparison of the, in the lower dose with the comparison of the reference. So all I'm trying to say is statistically significant because your rate ratio has not touched uh, the limit of one. And sorry, the range of the uh, ratios has not reached one, as well as it's 0.75. That means you're actually reducing these exacerbations because we're talking about severe exacerbations. Similar idea in annualized total dose of systemic glucocorticoid that you use. You're using 83 plus or minus versus 130 in the albuterol. You're using 94 versus 127 in the real albuterol. Very similar data for ITT, intention to treat, and pre-planned analysis. So what is this ACQ5 and AQLQ12 that I keep talking about? Remember on ACQ5, lower scores are better because five is a lower number. Just a strange way for me to remember. AQLQ12, higher scores are better. I'm going to start using that because if you look at it, and I'm not going to go over it, these are the questions that they look at. So just, just look at the first question. On average, during the past week, how often were you woken up by your asthma during the night? Well, if you say zero, that's a good thing, right? So lower scores are better on ACQ5. Oh, God. Where did I go? 
How did it go back here? Wait, where is Oh, right here. Sorry. Okay. Is it this thing? Slideshow? Sorry, guys. I, after I started using Apple, I cannot use Windows anymore. Um, and then on AQLQ12, I just want to show you one question. Higher scores are better. Why am I saying that? Look at the question. How limited have you been during the last two weeks in these activities? Well, if not at all, then that's a good answer, right? So it's just something I wanted to kind of touch base with, to, um, show it to you guys, what ACQ and AQLQ really um, actually means. Findings and results of safety outcomes, like every study, you have to look at the safety outcomes. Um, the serious adverse effects, including deaths, were very similar. Unfortunately, there were some deaths, but none of the deaths were related to the trial medications. Uh, common adverse effects they had mentioned were uh, very generic ones with the inhalers, such as candidiasis, dysphonia, and oropharyngeal candidiasis. They were all less than 1%. So just a couple of quick discussion on the study. Um, you know, it was a great study that I read. It was very simplistic. Uh, bar the statistical analysis that um, you have to look into and why they're using. Um, I don't usually do that, but it's obviously, it, it's good to know if they're kind of mentioning like, hey, this data was analyzed using this method. Well, what's the reason of it? What is it? What are they trying to prove, right? That's very, very important. Um, there was a low dropout rate, about 93% of the patients. It was a multiple multinational and double-blinded. So what does multinational study do? It increases your external validity, right? And what is validity? It's basically saying that, hey, this test, whatever it's actually supposed to measure, is it actually measuring that? If you're doing it multinationally, you can probably extrapolate it. Double-blinded, great for internal validity within the population that you tested. Um, there were reductions in the risk of exacerbations using this new strategy of albuterol and budesonide, but there have been studies that have performed in the past. I think Dr. Flores mentioned something about albuterol and betamethasone. They've done open label trial for with betamethasone. What's an open, open label trial? Um, it's where you're not blinding anybody. Everybody knows what's going on, what kind of treatment they got, researchers, as well as the patients. And the SMART strategy, SMART stands for um, similar maintenance and rescue therapy. So if you look at the last three bullet points and you combine the study that I'm presenting, it kind of looks like it's... Um, what is it called? There's a pooled multiple study, like a meta-analysis, right? So I even like the fact that they kind of, I, I did not get a chance to go look back at it um, and look at all the other studies, but it almost sounds like what they're trying to tell you, like, hey, there's three other studies. Now we have another study and we have a large sample size. Could this be considered a meta-analysis? I don't know, maybe. Um, evaluating the outcome and changes. So now this is my thought process, given risks and limitation of SABA alone. The trial is supporting inhaled glucocorticoid containing rescue medication because that is probably going to reduce some inflammation in an acute asthma exacerbation. Um, safety profile is great. Efficacy is great. You don't have to change anything underlying medications. The patients continue to take the exact same medications. So you're making one change for exacerbation, not for their maintenance therapy. Um, wanted to show you guys this link. Has nothing to do with the presentation itself, but I do have a question in the end that kind of shows uh, why am I trying to show this. So just a couple of graphs on here. So this is the most recent data I could find. Look at this. So the first figure is basically um, in the adults reporting they've ever had asthma in the Bear County. Across the year, brown line is Texas, blue line is San Antonio, Bear County specifically. That's going up. Um, only three data points, so I don't want to talk about, you know, extrapolating it much, but hey, that's some data there. Uh, inpatient hospitalizations, look at that. Texas is lower, San Antonio is on the higher side. So keep this in mind when I ask you guys a question in the end. Limitations and shortfalls of the study. They mentioned this and I had never known this, exhaled nitric oxide levels, because that's apparently a direct assessment of anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, sounds phenomenal. <clears throat> in a lab, but I don't think we ever do that. In practice, I'm not gonna sit there and tell a patient, like, let me get your nitric oxide levels first before I give you this medication, right? But hey, that's a, it's a study, it's a statistical study. Um, that's one of the limitations. They did use small number of children. That's definitely a limitation. And I forgot to mention that the higher dose 
albuterol, uh, budesonide and albuterol that they used, they did not give it to kids who were less than four years of age because of their age. Um, the other thing is growth indexes could not be assessed. It's just a fancy way of saying, it's my second to last point, well, it's statistical significance versus clinical significance. Yeah, it's statistically significant. Is it clinically important? It's, I always keep going to the blood pressure issue. Reducing four units of millimeters of mercury is great statistically, but does the patient really care? As a doctor, do you really care? So always keep that in mind in general. Nothing to do with the study, but just kind of keep in mind, always have that in the background um, when you're looking at a study. And the ethnicity comparison, you know, they did a multinational stuff, but how many times do we compare patients like, oh yeah, I treated a patient who just came from Canada. We don't talk like that. We just talk about race is obviously an important aspect when we look at just an overall general treatment plan, what the risk factors are and whatnot. So I was trying to find that. And if you guys know, let me know. I've only seen asthma action plans for pediatric population. I don't know if there's an asthma action plan for adults and I don't understand why we don't have one. Or if I don't know one, please let me know. Um, as a clinician, you are gonna be asked to do a lot of things, but who else can you involve? Pulmonology, right? Behavioral health, we have great support here primary care physicians, patients themselves, and I should have also added pharmacy on there. So it's just a multi-factor, uh, you know, multi-team approach that we're going to be able to create an asthma action plan for adults if we have to. Um, not going to drill too much on the summary. It's basically pretty much what I've said. Uh, I like the study. They had great inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, they're recommending, hey, corticosteroid usage as a rescue inhaler is great. Uh, probably some potential new rescue medication. And here's the question. Are we going to use this in the San Antonio grounds? Is that a feasible treatment? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm looking at the data. It is great. It looks great in theory. Uh, I'm very satisfied with this study. And like I said, I always try to look for reasons why I don't like a study. And I couldn't find many in this. Um, if I had to use it, um, if my attending doesn't tell me not to use it, I would love to use it. <laughs> Uh, but that's at least that's a discussion you can have with your attendings or when you're presenting or when you have a patient, you know, you can have this discussion with the with your patients. So they're also more educated goes back to Dr. Flores, what he was saying, education is very important. Uh, standard references, um, questions, comments, guys. Yeah. First one is at the beginning of your presentation, you commented that there was a, like discontinuation criteria, right? Did they comment on any discontinuation due to harm? And no. Statistical analysis? So they didn't say if there was and what medications were discontinued? No, they did not. The only thing they said is if you have had COPD, systemic local corticoids in the last. Oh, uh, which one was so it? That, like, Let me see. If, like there was three hospitalizations or five total, I can't remember. Yeah, 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 I'm trying to figure out where it is. They would like X those people in on the trial we don't want them, right? Which is super important in a study, especially- Oh, I see what you're saying, okay. Did they uh, present that data? I don't think they specifically presented. Also, they did not mention which treatment arm did they discontinue the patient yeah. with, right? So <laughs> my assumption is gonna be it was very, you know, that's a good question, right? So I've always thought about this, right? You lose patients, you lose your samples to a certain thing, but which treatment arm did they come out of? No, they absolutely did not, because that could actually change the bias. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree. Um, and then my other question was, that I, I don't know if you have any of this really interesting statistical analysis and one that I'm not very familiar with either, but I noticed that, okay, so the 26% reduction in time to frequency based on their... I was unclear. Is there pre-assumed, like based on the patient and what they expected? Or can you clarify? That? Yes, absolutely. That's a good question. So the twenty-six percent they're looking at. That's the primary uh, efficacy endpoint they're looking at, mm -hmm. and the primary efficacy endpoint is from the beginning of this trial, or actually they actually specified this from the beginning of the enrollment. What is the first incidence of you or of a patient in a trial arm? having the first asthma exacerbation. And then is the data for the next, like how did they determine- So they only said the first one, they never said first to second. How did they know? I just, I guess, or if somebody else knows, like how do they, how are they predicting that that time- No, it's not predictions. It is actually based on, I guess you're looking at the data retrospectively, like if you had an exacerbation in two months versus now in three months. 
So the cumulative probability, what they're saying is like, hey, if you are on the high dose of bedesonide and albuterol, there is a time difference of 26%. Now, I don't know what the units of 26% there is. You're correct. Well, I'm sure it's whatever what the time is. Yeah, yeah. But um, so the rescue medication that they're administering is like a whole rescue medication, and then their, their end point is hospitalization. So, well, so, to your good. Attack, so their end point is an asthma exacerbation, which they define as one of the criteria. Of, man, it's there somewhere I know it. Um, sorry, guys. There you go. At least one severe asthma exacerbation. That was the criteria that they looked at. Uh, in order to enroll the patients. And then when they talk about the 26% reduction, they just said first asthma exacerbation. They did not go back and specify what that endpoint means. So I can only connect the dots saying what that. Using the medication that they're studying. Is what do you it mean? not during the severe asthma exacerbation? I think that's where I'm. Studying. No. So the idea is to simply replace your albuterol anytime you're having at an home. exacerbation at home okay. throughout the 24 week period. Gotcha. If you have a severe asthma exacerbation as defined by That's these criteria, the that, that is the point is. they're looking at. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, sorry yeah. about that. I, I definitely did not specify that, well, just, but I'm good that, that you asked. The title of the actual journal article is confusing yeah. because it's people who are using this new medication at home instead of their rescue inhaler. Correct. How far in time do they get before they go to the hospital? Essentially? Yeah, they didn't mention that. And remember, they were also discouraged to use anything else. Yeah. Discouraged is a yeah. keyword yeah. now. And it's just analyzing time. It's not analyzing what happens during the exacerbation. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because then my presentation would be an hour long. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Yes, ma'am. Do you know anything about like the cost of this the albuterol uh, steroid medication versus albuterol, like insurance coverage? Absolutely no idea. I don't believe it is the standard of care, and uh, probably we can get some feedback from our attendings, but I don't think this is the standard of care. Remember, this is phase three. This is not phase four. It's not post marketing surveillance yet. We're in phase three. So I don't know when insurance even looks at it. It's not because it's phase three. It's not phase four yet. Yeah, thank you. It's not going to be cheap. Anything else, guys? Anything at all? Whenever it's not covered by the insurance, it's easy because we have it documented that we have to take something first. So it's just the insurance must be posted before, and that's it. And if it's needed, it's needed in guidelines, basically. I, I'm not sure what's the problem because like, there was something when I tried to order and they had a call. Would you rather use this or this? Or it wasn't, it wasn't similar to the end of the day, but then it takes to the, the other article. I would do a too because it would help. But insurance wise, does anyone know what, what's the reason of the denial? Is it just not covered for the disease? Because I think for COPD, it's not that good and it's covered, but I'm not sure what's other situations. So the question being asked by the audience is, if Symbicode gets denied or this trial medication that... Why is Symbicode covered by most insurances? I have no idea why Symbicode is not covered by the insurance. Oh. And you get to participate in a very interesting year and year. Everybody good? All right, guys, thank you. Okay, let's take a five minute break. You need to go to the bathroom, stretch your leg, people keep starting in our memory. I <laughs> 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 <laughs>